Ocean Hills, it's DJ here. Welcome to the Sunday Worship Experience online. As usual, you're about to hear a sermon from Pastor John, but before we go there, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to those of you who have faithfully and regularly given to Ocean Hills to move our mission forward. Some of you know this, but we're finishing up Beach Camp, just finished it up on Friday, and it was amazing. And that's because so many of you make it possible. So thank you so much for that. Another thing is this Saturday, we're having our last silent retreat with Pastor Jono up at the Mission. Make sure you go to our Connect, Grow, Serve page to get on that, because that'll be the last one. And finally, next Sunday, you're not gonna be watching us on video because we're going to be at the beach. Speaking of the beach, so come to East Beach. We'll be there at 10 a.m. per usual, right at the usual spot where we do church at the beach. And if you wanna get baptized, this is your day to say yes to a life with Jesus. Reach out to Jono at oceanhills.org and tell him you're ready to be baptized and he'll take it from there. God bless you guys, enjoy the service today. What's up Ocean Hills, it's John Ireland here and uh, so excited to jump into this series that we're in, I just love it. It's called or titled Invitations. And as I have reminded us each week, invitations are so powerful, both ways. If you get excluded, you don't get the invite. It hurts, it, it, it's an ouch. Uh, you feel uh, maybe embarrassed, it's just, right? But the power of being invited to a party, to an event, into somebody's life, to lunch, whatever it is, to a dinner party. You feel noticed, you feel important, you feel significant, you feel like, wow, you know? And this series is, the big idea is, we serve a God, we follow a God, we worship a God who is an inviter. He is, always extending invitations to every one of us. And this series is looking at the different kinds of invitations. And why? Why is God always inviting us? I want you to hear this. It's, it, it really is in the heart of God that He wants so much more for you than He wants from you. Did you hear that? Because sometimes we live our lives and we're like, oh gosh, God just always wants something from me. You know, this obedient... No. God, when he invites us into making a change, stretching ourselves to grow, it's for our best good, our best interests. It's for us to become more and more like Jesus. That's, that's the real deal right there. Every invitation that God gives to you and to me is to make us more like Jesus. But our part is to say yes. We have to keep saying yes to the invitations and it's only in that yes, and we stretch and we trust that then we what? Our lives are transformed. We experience the breakthroughs. We're set free and we become, which is a discipleship word, we become more like Jesus. I want you to think about mentoring for a moment. And I'm gonna guess that you've had mentors in your life, maybe business mentors. Could be that your parents, were mentors in, in life for you. It could be um, at work, your boss was a mentor. It could be in church that you've had spiritual mentors in your life. Um, maybe marriage mentors, maybe parenting, you know. But mentors help show us the way. They've, they've lived, they have more experience. And, and we, those of us that mentor, we tap into that life experience and we pass it on. We help others grow, and that's our heart and our vision for this church is that you would become a mentor, a discipler, that you at some point will begin to help others grow. That's, I want you to know that's our heart at Ocean Hills. Well, today we're going to look at a character in the Bible, and we're gonna let him mentor us. You know, I often say that John Stott, I, I, I met him, but I say his writings mentored me. Rick Warren, I get a little daily hope from him every morning. It's mentoring me. I've never met Rick Warren, but he's mentoring me through his writings. Dallas Willard, 
Never met him, but through his writings, he's shaping me and, and impacting my life through his writings. Well, today, King David, this character is my favorite Bible character in the Bible because his life is so messy. He made, he made some stupid choices, but he was a leader and, and his heart was right. He wanted so much to be close to God and experience a real relationship with God. But he also made some dumb choices that, uh, you know, he would have been thrown out of most churches, okay? But I want him to mentor us because, you know, part of mentoring is you're good at some things and some things you're not. And, and where David was really spot on, where he was really mature, where he really trusted Christ and, and God and, and, and followed him, was in this area of money and giving. And I want to start, before I read the passage, I want to ask you, where did you learn in your life? Where did you learn how to give? Who, who taught you how to give money? Not time. I'm, I'm talking specifically about money right now. Who modeled that for you? Who pulled you alongside them and said, this is how we do things as followers of Jesus? Who, who told you how much you should give? And why? And how often? Uh, and with what kind of attitude, right? And with what kind of strings attached, if any? Like who taught you and modeled it? Where'd you catch like how to give? I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And so this idea of giving and having mentors in my life around giving financially to the mission and work of God, this came later for me in life. I needed God to bring books and authors, but also people. And people in our church that are still at our church today have modeled and mentored me in this area of giving. Larry Osborne's a pastor in San Diego area, big church. He said this, discipleship is pushing you in areas that you don't want to go. Real life discipleship, not just we're pontificating, quoting Bible verses, but real life discipleship is when we push each other in areas that you don't want to go. This is going to be a discipleship moment right here, right now, this message for most of us, because I'm going to push you in area that you might feel uncomfortable, but don't check out, don't tune out. I want to push us to grow, to stretch, to become more like Jesus. So I want you to imagine King David. His story is found in 1st and 2nd Samuel and the Chronicles and the Psalms. He wrote so many. But he's at the end of his life. And now he's going to mentor us through his speech. And we're going to look next week at his prayer. But Verse 28 of 1 Chronicles 29, right at the end of the chapter, it says this, David died. So we know he's at the end of his life. David died at a ripe old age, and he enjoyed a long life, wealth, and honor. He enjoyed a long life, wealth, and honor. And what we're going to learn about David is he was a very, very generous and sacrificial financial giver. And when he ended his life, he wasn't poor, he wasn't homeless, he wasn't on the street. It doesn't work that way. Generous people don't become poor when they give to the work of God. I, I, if, if, if you have given sacrificially and generously and became homeless because of it, and you gave to the work of God, I want you to call me. I want to hear your story. But here we go. Three, uh, three lessons from this speech that David gives. Here he is at the end of his life. And he says this, then King David said to the whole assembly, I'm in verse one of 1 Chronicles 29, my son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen to replace David as king is young and inexperienced. The task is great because the palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord. So let me just pause. David now, God has said, you're not gonna build my temple, David. Solomon is. Um, and it's a big task, right? And, and, and so this is the context now. David is speaking to that. He says, the task is great because this 
building, this structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. Verse two, with all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God, gold, silver, bronze, and on and on, he says, all of these in large quantities. Verse three, besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I've provided for this holy temple. Verse six, then the leaders of families, that's parents, (laughs) the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. Underline that in your Bible. Verse seven, they gave toward the work on the temple of God. And then verse nine says, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Let's unpack this. Three lessons that that we learn from David He's modeling for us from his speech, but from his choices, from his actions. He's mentoring us in this moment. Let King David mentor you right now. Here's three reflections, three lessons that we learn from his speech and his perspective. Number one, the building, this structure is not for man, but for God. Did you see that? That's what he said. And in the message, Eugene Peterson writes it this way. This is not just a place for people to meet each other, but a house for God to meet us. I love that. And this, this gathering hub that we are, we are purchasing in downtown Santa Barbara, 1002 Anacapa Street, this building, this structure is not for man, but for God. That's how David's mentoring us. He's saying it's time to adopt a different mindset. Some of us are going, wait, it's not a Sunday morning where we meet once a week for church. No, it's not. This is a six, maybe seven day a week facility where we're going to meet each other, but not just that, we're gonna honor God in every way in this building, not just Sunday morning, one hour a week. This is a building that's gonna be used five, six nights a week that groups are gonna be gathering and hearing about Jesus and about him being the life giver and that the best pathway for life is God's ways, not the world's ways, right? And this is a change of perspective. I think so often we, we look at a building and, and we're thinking that this is for man, this is for me. Hey, this is for me and my kids. I mean, I'm the pastor of this church. This is. We're going to call it the Ireland Memorial Building, aren't we? No, we're not. No, we're not. In fact, we're not going to call it by anybody's name who who writes a check. This is God's building for God's glory. It's it's for him. And that's what David is. It's how he's mentoring us right now. This building is for God's glory. It's a space to for you and for me and, and our un church friends, people that are far from God to come and and hear God's voice and be shaped by his love and be encouraged by God's family as we encounter him in this space. Wow, different mindset, friends. And we have to adopt this David mindset. The building is, is not for me. It's not for man. It's for God and his glory. Everything we do, it's not about me. It's about him. Second lesson we learn, let David mentor you right now. Just listen to him. We're, just imagine you're around a fire pit or around a table and he talks. He, 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 he's, he says, let, let me just share some things. Second lesson, David gave, and this is in verse two, David gave to this structure, to this building, he gave from all his resources. Did you notice that in the text? Just circle that word, all. Are you hearing me? Circle that word, gold, silver, bronze, turquoise, iron. I mean, it's listed there. It represents the multiple resources at David's disposal. And I want to just say, 
and it's about to get uncomfortable. Many of us have resources beyond just our salary, right? Beyond just our weekly or monthly income that we count on. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah, no, I, I give on that. Wait, you're, wait, you're not going to touch. And just think about your assets and my assets. Some of us, we have appreciated stock. That's part of all the resources that David's talking about. Some of us have real estate that we own, buildings that we own, rental income from buildings that uh, are, is, is outside of our regular thing. ADU units where we have renters that it provides additional income, right? That's part of the all his resources. I've talked to five people in our church in the last two months that are selling a house, either their house in town or a vacation home or a building. And guess what? Every single one said, man, I'm glad I didn't sell it two years ago. I've made over a million dollars or more on my real estate because of this housing boom we're in right now. Well, wow. I would say to you, if your house sells, I would, I, it would beg the question, huh, I'm the benefit of that blessing from God. And I wonder if maybe out of that bounty and abundance that God might be calling me to give from all my resources. Is that my income? This is over and above. This is extra. Some of you just finished helping pay for your kids college. You're going, Yahoo. Well, now you've got some discretionary income. Wow. That positions you maybe to give generously and sacrificially. Others of you, I've heard, oh man, you're bragging about you refinanced your home and you got two point something percent. You're going, this is incredible. Look at all this money. That's God's blessing. Now you have more disposable income, cash flow. Wow. Could you maybe connect that to God's blessing in your life? And maybe that gives you and positions you to give generously to the work and mission of God. What about, I just have here, stimulus checks, a tax return, an inheritance that you received in the last year, uh, a bonus that was unusual or usual, but it was bigger than you thought. I mean, all of these things fall under David gave from all his resources. Now, I just believe David is mentoring us right now, and I'm gonna just confess, it's making me uncomfortable. Because as I, as I list that, I'm going, that's me, that's me, that's me. So that, that, that means I've got to give pause and I got to do my own gut check, right? I just believe there are sacred moments. There are sacred moments in life when we give to God's house from all of our resources. It's not weekly, it's not monthly, it's not even annually, but there come, become opportunities. And I believe we're in one right now. 23 years as a church, and now here we are. We're in this moment. I'm going to call it a sacred moment, and I'm going to hope and pray it's a divine appointment for you that are listening and watching, that this is the moment that God would say, I want you to give from all your resources, not just your monthly income right now. In Acts chapter 4, there's a story of Barnabas, the great encourager, spiritual encourager and mature, and it says that he sold a field and he gave all the money to the apostles. Who does that? Godly people do that. People that trust God. That's from all his resources, right? That's an example of generosity and sacrifice. So here's the uncomfortable question. Would you today, would you take a, an inventory of all your resources? And I know a lot of it's not liquid for, for many of you, but. What might it take for you to participate and enter into this really sacred moment, divine appointment time in the life of our God family? What resources might you have that you could give from? All right, here's my third reflection lesson from David's perspective from this story in 1 Chronicles 29. Here it is. Are you ready? This one's going to make me uncomfortable too, and I hope it does you. It's one, here's, notice what you notice. Well, here's what I notice in verse three and following. The leaders gave first and they gave willingly. 
The leaders gave first. David and then the other leaders gave first. They led by example. Their giving to God's house was over and above what they were already giving. Here's my challenge. If you're on staff at Ocean Hills, if you're on the leadership team at Ocean Hills, if you're a children's ministry leader, if you're a small group leader, you're a spiritual leader in this church. We, we go first. We lead by example. We set the pace for sacrifice and generosity for the rest of our church. Now, I have a very close friend. We're we were talking about money and about giving to this building and to this gathering hub and to God's mission and God's work. And, 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 and he interrupted me and he said, well, no, no, you don't have to give, John. You're the pastor. And you're giving so much sweat equity. You don't have to give financially. I was like, oh, God, I love that. Man, thank you for that. I'm so glad I, I can opt out, right? That's amazing. So then I go to a few guys in my pastor's roundtables, guys that are obviously more mature than I am. And I told them that and they're like, a nice try, no way. You're the leader of that church. You lead by example, you go first. And I want you to know, Natalie and I are leading. We are sacrificing. We are having ongoing conversations about where else can we give? How, how much more can we give? Parents, you're a spiritual leader in your home. I pray that during this season where we're talking about getting a church home for our God family at Ocean Hills, that you will shape your kids in conversation. That you'll, you'll say like Max Beers taught me this phrase. He's, he tells his kids, this is who we are. This is what we do. I love that. There's, it's a defining moment for your family. You talk about, hey, we are giving to our church. We want to help build a church home and provide so our church can have a home downtown. So this is what our family's doing. That's healthy. To t it's not bragging. It's processing. It's collaborating. It's discipling and mentoring your kids in giving. Uh, verse 9 says, the leaders also gave freely and willingly, not from guilt or pressure. Let me just say, giving under pressure, I've, I've done that. It leads to resentment. Giving from guilt, it's unhealthy. It's not God's way. It's not what God dreams for you. It creates resentment. It, it, it misses the point of giving. Giving freely and willingly is what God dreams for his people because we're being shaped by God's grace and God's love. We're being transformed by God's word and we're being inspired by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why we give. It's the grace of giving. I've challenged you. I've pushed. I hope that you will just camp out in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 this week. I hope that you'll circle and circle the way and just keep circling and stay in it and chew on it and meditate on it and ask God to speak to you and to give you eyes to see, but then give you a heart that's responsive, that's obedient. And ask God, God, how do you want me to respond to this message? And then thank God for King David. Thank God for King David's mentoring of us in giving. He's taught us from his perspective that this building is not for man, but for God, that we give at certain moments in life from all of our resources. And finally, that leaders give first and they give willingly, not angry and grumpy and like, oh, the church just wants our money. Don't do it. That's, that means your heart is missing out on the joy and the grace of giving. And that's how that story ends it. I mean, it, they were joyful. Did you read that in the story? I mean, they were joyful at the very end. Let me just finish, verse nine. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced greatly. That's what God wants for you, to celebrate, to be filled with joy, because you have resources that are gonna help others find and follow Christ. God bless you. Let me pray. God, 
Now, as we think about what we've heard, we're also going to get to listen in on a little interview that I'm going to have with my mentor, friend and colleague, Kurt Peterson. I pray that, that, that the Spirit of God would take the Word of God and the words that we share and that, 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 that God, you would somehow use that to plant seeds in our heart that would bear fruit in radical generosity, sacrifice, and faithfulness in my heart, in, in the heart of your people that call themselves the family at Ocean Hills. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy my conversation with Kurt. I'm here with Kurt Peterson, friend, colleague, mentor. We worked together for 13 years. He's had a huge impact on my life and uh, it's such an honor and privilege to be in my own backyard sitting here with Kurt and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the impact of giving and uh, his role but you know some of you may not know that Kurt uh, as the pastor of Montecito Covenant all those years ago he was the one who built the bridge and supported the vision to start a brand new church in Santa Barbara that we call Ocean Hills without his support wouldn't have happened and so uh so grateful uh to you for that partnership but also um kurt is celebrating 50 years of marriage uh this month and 50 years of vocational uh, ministry and he's retiring or reassignment they say when he moves to santa barbara we're going to figure out a way to get him on our staff i hope but uh 50 years and that's incredible of faithfulness and sacrifice and then also, Kurt has also been instrumental in our mission in the DR Congo. Kurt was the one, as the executive director of World Mission for our denomination, who helped build the bridge uh, between Ocean Hills and the DR Congo so that all that we're doing there with uh, clean water and sanitation, education, all of that, again, it was the seeds you planted in my heart and the, bi uh, the bridge you built. So, Kurt... Welcome, and I just invite him to, to, to share a few stories about giving and sacrifice that he's seen around the world. So go for it. Well, thanks, John. It's a privilege to be with you, and um, I want to thank you for your commitment uh, to what God's doing around the world. I, I've had an opportunity to see the grace of giving in different places in this world. Yeah. The Apostle Paul talks about God giving grace to the Macedonian churches so that in the midst of severe trial they o were overwhelmed with joy and extreme poverty that welled up in generosity. Wow. Yeah. Just an unusual experience. And Paul talks about your generosity will result in thanksgivings to God. Mm. So I want to give thanksgivings to God what, for what I have seen. In South Sudan I was at a worship service, and during a worship service, they have an offering, and that offering is one where they dance their offering forward. I love that. It takes about 45 minutes for a congregation to give their offering. But I was especially taken by a young mother who had a baby in her arm and a toddler at her side, and she, as in so many in that community, have nothing. I mean, nothing. But she came forward because she wanted to be part of what God was doing through that ministry of the church. Mm. So she came and I saw her put her, her small offering, significant offering, in that basket. Then they made another call for a second offering. This is a, a, an Love opportunity. Two, two, two offerings, offering. John. <laughs> and the second <laughs> offering was not for themselves, but for church planting. Mm. And I saw this woman come again because she wanted to be part of the good news going to other people. Wow. And so she gave. It, and at that point, it made me want to empty my wallet and, and be part of this as well. The second story I would tell you. Let me is, stop right yeah. there. That, what I love about the point you just made is her faithfulness and generosity inspired faith in you you yeah. wanted to and i think that's a true principle that our our faithfulness inspires the faith of others in our giving that's absolutely. awesome absolutely absolutely and what i would give or what she would give that that, that isn't the amount yeah. that is judged by god or thought yeah. of god it's about that heart of generosity that comes from the grace of god being overflowing in our lives I love that and it happened 
also in Congo, I mean, over and over again. But one story that really touched me was the church there in the Congo that we're part of uh, and partners with uh, wanted to have an opportunity to spread the good news to more people. But walking is not always the most efficient way to do that. So they wanted to raise money, $50,000 equivalent, for a truck and fuel for evangelism and planting new churches. People all wanted to be part of this. Now, this is in a place at that time where people were making $2 a day if they could make $2 a day. Their, Their gardens and maybe $2 a day. And there was one woman, I heard the story, as she came to give her offering, a blind woman, elderly woman, wanted to be part of it. Don't leave me out of what God's doing in this world and sharing this good news. She would go to the river and fill bags with sand and take to the market to sell for people to to buy there so she would have money and she brought that money to give for the evangelism truck. That was the way she gave. And she did it over and over again. There was another woman who gathered sticks Mm -hmm. and made charcoal and sold them at the market. If you don't have cash, you you find a way. And these people were giving in a way, again, inspiring. They so experienced the grace of God and the love of God that it overflowed from them in a way that was very tangible, Mm -hmm. as it is for all disciples. And that is, you experience the grace of God, grace of God, it pours out in generosity to others. And it comes sometimes, often, in very tangible ways, whether it's a bag of sand, a piece of charcoal, or a coin in in a purse, and again, I just wanted to empty the whole covenant's wallet yeah. uh, over this so that we could be part of it. And in fact, it, it, it prompted me at that moment, okay, we're going to help fund this, this fuel for this truck yeah. for the next year because God's people at Ocean Hills, at Montecito, want to be part of this and we want to share that with you. So that's the grace of giving, the, just an example of two places in two countries, but God's doing it all over the world. How good is that? Wow. Thank you so much. So good. So good. And I hope that inspires us that we're not going to pressure people. We don't give out of guilt. That that doesn't work. But it's the overflow of grace received that then pours out through us. When we receive God's grace, then we become the dispenser of God's grace through giving. So thank you. Yeah. God bless you. you. Yeah. 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 I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me 
His favor be upon you into a thousand generations and your families and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you within you. Never sways, you'll never let go. This love is wild. 